because already two and a half, that's getting bigger. Averaged over a century, we would, we would add per year at least three, probably more. That would take us at least to 750. Suppose we stopped it right there in terms of the accumulation. What would the effect be? Well, and I'm speaking now of a fairly conservative model of these probabilities associated with one of the four or five best um, climate change centres in the world, the Hadley Centre in uh, Exeter in the UK. There are other very good centres in Princeton and in, in, in Japan and, 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 and so on, but the, uh, uh, the Hadley probabilities are moderately central to this story and actually leave out quite a lot of the risks. But just take a simple model which leaves out the risks of the melting of the of the permafrost and the release of more methane, leaves out the risk of the collapse of the Amazon, which is quite likely at three degrees, and the Amazon forest is quite likely at three degrees centigrade. Um, let's take that Hadley model. It tells us that at around 750 parts per million, the uh, temperature increase would likely be 50-50 um, uh, either side of five degrees centigrade. So 50% probability either side of five degrees centigrade. Now, that may not, not sound very much if you're contemplating uh, Moscow in February, um, but it is actually huge. The planet hasn't been there um, for something like 30 million years. Now, human beings have been around for 100,000. It depends what weight you put on sapiens in Homo sapiens. 100,000, maximum 200,000 under any definition of sapiens. We haven't been there 5 degrees centigrade for 30 million years. We've been five degrees centigrade below, moderately often and moderately recently, that's the last ice age, 10, 12,000 years ago, the ice sheets came down to uh, roughly the latitude of, uh, of uh, London and uh, New York. And where were people? People were closer to the equator than that. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that these kinds of changes of this magnitude radically affect where people can be. The ice melted and the UK separated from uh, Europe and uh, you can think about whether that was a good idea or not. <laughs> of course, the rivers, the rivers of the world changed radically in their flows. We know very recently about five degrees centigrade downwards and the effects are dramatic in where people can live. The same is very likely to be true of five degrees centigrade upwards, except that humans have never been there. They've never been anywhere near there. It's uh, around three million years since we've been at three degrees centigrade, all this above middle of the 19th century, that's my benchmark. It's trans it would transform where people could live. Most of southern Europe would look like probably the Sahara Desert. Um, big parts of the world would, uh, this, these things happen quite slowly but relentlessly, big parts of the world would be inundated. Uh, rivers would change, um, many rivers would change their patterns and their flows. This is the kind of change we're talking about. Other parts of the world be so devastated by hurricanes that uh, they would not be suitable for habitation. This kind of rewriting is just very large. Now this isn't Nick Stern, the economist, speaking. This is Nick Stern, the consumer of the science, who sat down quietly with the best scientists in the world, tried to read up and tried to see this as a risk management problem, and then asked what are the kind of economic instruments, what are the kind of costs of managing this kind of risks, this kind of risk. But the science on this is very, very simple and uh, crystal clear and crystal clear to 99 point something percent of the climate scientists. It isn't crystal clear to every taxi driver, to every guy behind the bar or to every president of the country in countries in the, uh, in the region. But do you go to them for your um, nuclear physics or your um, pharmacology or no. It's a job of political decision makers, people who design policy, to cross question, to listen, to try to understand, but not to do the science. I mean this is very clear, simple stuff and um, lots of uncertainties there, lots of things to refine, but we know much more about the probability distributions than uh, we did before, but the basic phenomenon of this relentless rise in concentrations and therefore the warming is very clear. There'll be big fluctuations. There'll be um, El Nino and La Nina, as we've seen, as, in, as we do see fairly regularly. Um, there'll be changes in the uh, structure of the Earth's orbit. That's the kind of thing that brings you uh, ice ages. There'll be fluctuations in the solar uh, activity in the sun. All these fluctuations will be there, but they'll 
basically powerful underlying trend that we're generating through the emissions of greenhouse gases will move us in the direction of this very, very big changes over a very short period of time. You know, 100 years to get up into, uh, or 120 years, whatever it might be, to get up into 5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial times is just enormous. So here's the question. What would you pay to bring down that probability of 50-50 dramatically? Well, if we held at 500 parts per million, we're already at 435, if we held at 500, then the probability of going above 5 degrees centigrade drops down to about 3%. Now, we don't really know whether these probabilities at 500 are 2%, 3%, 4%, or whether the probability I gave you is 45, 50, 55, or 60. But we do know with some confidence that we could dramatically cut that probability by holding to 500 parts per million. What would we need to do that? We'd need to bring by the uh, 2050, we'd have to bring emissions down as a world from the over 50 gigatons they are now to about 20 gigatons. Now you can always do a bit more before and a bit more later because this is a flow stock problem. But roughly speaking, the paths that could stabilize at 500 parts per million and then bring it on down from there because we'd have to, um, would involve having around 20 gigatons in 2050. Now that is a number that you have to keep hold of. Because wherever you go, people put their arm around you and say, Nick, this is a really serious problem, but you do have to understand that China's different. You do have to understand that the United States is different. You do have to understand that Australia is different. You do have to understand that Russia is different. Of course the average, is ha average has to be such that the total is 20 gigatons, but we're going to have to be a bit more than that. You really, yeah? Now, what will the average have to be? There'll be 9 billion people in 2050. 20 divided by 9, just over 2. We have to average 2 tonnes per capita. There won't be many people below 2 tonnes per capita, so there can't be many people above. This isn't Lake Wobegon, where all the men are beautiful, all the women are strong, and all the children are above average. The average is the average. If there are not many people below, there can't be many people above. So that brutal arithmetic, and it's very simple and very direct, tells us that we have to get down to around 2 tonnes per capita. European Union is now 10, 12 tonnes per capita, if you look at all the greenhouse gases together, not just CO2, and all the sources of greenhouse gases. That means that we have to divide by roughly 5. That's why we talk about 80% reductions, 1990 to 2050, and we've got our European targets along the way. Europe's acted early and strongly, and it's invented the right kinds of economic tools, like the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme. United States, Australia, Canada are over 20 tonnes per capita. Barack Obama has declared that the US will have 80% reductions 1990 to 2050. Um, he really meant to say 90%, but we'll excuse him the uh, slip of the tongue, because you know, to get down from 20 to 2, you divide by 10. Yeah? But that actually doesn't matter too much at the moment. The key is to start off strongly down the right road, and we'll learn like mad along the way, we'll revise some of these numbers, but basically, that 20 gigatons is what anchors world policy. And when we come out of Copenhagen, it has to be in December on the basis of 20 gigatons. So, as the total for the world, and we have to keep the score sheet. Yeah? Now, we've actually come a very long way in this story, um, because out of this simple logic, we've got the kind of reductions we need to make. We've been talking about numbers like that for the world, 50% reductions by uh, 1990 to 2050 at the last two G8 summits. And no doubt the Italians will provide the kind of leadership, and I think it, it will happen, which will take us further